Okay, uh, greetings. So, welcome to uh, today's class. So, quick uh, recap of what we uh, discussed in the previous lecture. So, we were uh, looking at uh, breaking, we just uh, looked at you know what are the functional uh, uh, requirements of a break and then we briefly looked at you know how breaks evolve from uh, very simple mechanisms to where we are today particularly with respect to the drum break and the disc break and uh, we uh, discussed certain important attributes that is required of what is called as a friction break system which is what we are discussing you know like uh, and those attributes were in terms of uh, stopping distance stability and reliability okay so let's continue from here <coughs> so the first uh, topic that we are going to discuss would be uh, to identify in general what are the various uh, components of a uh, brake system okay so that's uh, something which we'll uh, start off with so <coughs> so if you look at any general uh, brake system you know like uh, how can we uh, uh, enumerate you know like the various components that constitute uh, that okay so the first uh, broad component is the source of energy okay so if you look at uh, sources of energy in a in a brake system uh, we can immediately uh, realize that uh, most commonly in any vehicle that we would be driving right uh, let us say we start from a bicycle to a two wheeler and a four wheeler and so on the main source of energy would be the human effort of course which gets magnified and then transmitted down the line to the wheels but as it stands you know the main uh, effort or the energy source uh, comes from the uh, human being right. So, essentially if we uh, look at the uh, sources of energy the uh, human effort is a uh, primary source however you know like in many scenarios this human effort is augmented by what is called as an assist system or a boost system uh, for example we would look at what is called as a vacuum booster uh, when we uh, look at uh, hydraulic brakes so the uh, the pedal input or the force that is provided by the driver is magnified or augmented you know like by assist systems okay and in some cases what we call as power brakes we have a separate source of energy for example let us say we take uh, uh, heavy vehicle brakes you know like uh, trucks and buses what happens is that like in them you know like we have compressed air you might have seen these uh, tanks on the side of a truck with air written on them right. So, those tanks essentially store compressed air pressurized air and air is taken from the atmosphere and a compressor pressurizes and stores them stores the uh, uh, compressed air in them right. So, then when the driver presses the brake pedal in a truck or a bus what the driver is actually doing is not to transmit the force to the wheels directly however the driver is only regulating how much compressed air is taken from those tanks and given to the uh, brakes on the wheel such brake systems are what are called power brakes okay. So, where the driver is only regulating or metering out a source of energy okay so in a power brake uh, the driver input is used to modulate a source of energy okay so an example is an air brake which we will discuss in detail uh, later on. So, those are typical uh, sources of energy uh, in a brake system. The second uh, component broad set of components you know like in a typical brake system is a mechanism for applying the brake 
So, typically if we uh, look at how we apply brakes, right? So, all of us are uh, familiar with uh, how we apply the brakes. So typically, we use uh, let us say hand levers, right? Or foot pedal, correct? So, for uh, actuating the brake or applying the brake. So, typically, these uh, mechanisms uh, take the form of foot pedal or hand levers, right? So, that is a mechanism for applying the brake. <coughs> Third uh, broad uh, set of components in a brake system is what is called as an energy transmitting medium. So, the question is how is the energy transmitted from the source to the wheels, right? Please note that we are dealing with friction braking. That means that on the wheels, you know, we have these brake units which essentially convert the kinetic energy into thermal energy, right? So, from the source of energy or the from the point of uh, the driver actuation, how is the energy for braking transmitted? So, we have once again different uh, possibilities. In a purely mechanical brake, for example, you know like uh, in bicycles and also like uh, most uh, light two wheelers, right? So, we would have seen that the energy transmitting medium from let us say the hand lever would be in the form of cables, some levers, rods and so on, right? So, that is purely mechanical, right? So, mechanical brakes essentially utilize uh, levers, rods, cables, etcetera to transmit this energy. Okay? So, that is a mechanical brake. So, most uh, passenger cars, SUVs, certain class of light commercial vehicles, certain class of motorcycles you know like so would use a hydraulic brake which uses an incompressible fluid an almost incompressible fluid right. So, what we call as a brake fluid so to transmit the <coughs> energy okay. So, that is what happens in a hydraulic brake right. So, then we have air brakes which are used in uh, trucks and buses, uh, they utilize uses uh, compressed air as the energy transmitting medium, right. So, we can also have combination of these. So, we can have a combination of these uh, energy transmitting medium also. So, for example, we can have what are called air over hydraulic brakes, okay. Part of the energy transmission is done by compressed air and then like then uh, part over brake fluids and so on, right. So, we can have a, a, a mixture of them. But as we discussed in the previous class when we talked about reliability, we typically introduce a redundancy to prevent failure in the component uh, which we deem to be most susceptible to failure. And if we look at the brake system per se, we are going to look at one more component in a very generic uh, brake system, right. So, the, the weakest link is going to be this energy transmission circuit, okay. So, the energy transmission circuit is going to be the, uh, is going to be more prone, it is not, it is still what to say good but then like chances of uh, failure creeping in, falls creeping in are uh, relatively more, right. So, then uh, we uh, look at by regulation, now we need to use what are called as dual circuit systems, you know like to essentially uh, uh, protect against uh, failure. So, consequently there are, there is what is called as this notion of uh, split system, okay. So, what do I mean by split systems, you know like so. The, uh, the energy transmission circuit or the path you know can be uh, designed to be a single circuit 
system or a dual circuit system. <coughs> so, what do we mean by this? You know, like single circuit means as the name indicates, there is only one circuit for transmitting the energy. So, imagine that you know, like we had only one uh, uh, point of control for the driver and there is only one essentially circuit you know like uh, let it be hydraulic mechanical or compressed air that provides this energy to let us say all the wheel or uh, the brakes on all the wheels right. So, use only uh, one circuit for transmitting the energy required for braking okay. and obviously if there is any failure in this or fault in this circuit that is going to be very detrimental right. So, no friction braking or no braking would be available if the circuit fails right obviously. So, that is a limitation of uh, a single circuit system. Now, almost all brakes are dual circuit systems you know like uh, they are mandated to be dual circuit systems. So, you can see that this is seen very naturally in let us say in bicycles or certain class of two wheelers right. So, for example, if you look at uh, two wheelers you know like our left hand lever would typically actuate the <coughs> rear brake and the right will actuate the front okay, in bicycles and certain class of two wheelers. Where you have the left hand lever in a two wheeler connected to a clutch, your rear brake is going to be actuated by a foot pedal right. So, you can immediately see that there are two control points for the driver and the consequently there will be two separate circuits right. So, that is very clearly visible you know from the outside. In a passenger car you know there is only one control point typically or one point for actuation which is the foot pedal. But as we will see that when we uh, look at the hydraulic brake system internally there is going to be a split we will see how it happens right when we discuss a hydraulic brake system right. So, dual circuit systems uh, use two circuits to transmit this energy. And the main advantage as we would have realized uh, partial braking is available in the event of failure of one of the two circuits that is a big advantage is it not right. So, we still have partial uh, brake capacity or braking capacity even if one circuit fails right. So, that is an uh, advantage of a uh, dual circuit brake system. We will see how they are realized in hydraulic and uh, air brakes as we uh, go on okay. So, that is the energy transmitting medium and circuit. So, the, uh, the fourth broad set of components in a typical uh, brake system essentially take the form of foundation brakes. So, what are foundation brakes? The, these are essentially the brake units of the wheels. So, that essentially act on the wheels right uh, then use the energy that is transmitted by the energy transmission circuit and then convert the vehicle kinetic energy into thermal energy and dissipate it. So, today you know like if you look at uh, foundation brakes the two common uh, brakes that are used are the drum brakes and the disc brakes okay. So, let us look at them more closely okay. So, these are the four broad set of uh, components. So, let us uh, go and uh, <coughs> look at uh, drum brakes first. So, as we discussed in the previous class uh, 
the uh, notion of drum brakes came about from the concept of this internal expanding brake, right? So, where we wanted to have the friction element uh, within an enclosure and when the brake was applied these uh, friction pads moved outside and contacted the inner surface of a rotating element to generate the uh, braking torque, right? So, that is the con basic concept behind a uh, drum brake. So, let us look at various uh, realizations of a, a drum brake. So, if I am this is just a photograph of a drum brake uh, that is used in heavy vehicles, we look at uh, other con uh, what to say configurations also. So, what happens here, right? So, let me paste another diagram. So, this is a schematic of a drum brake which is used in. hydraulic brakes like in cars and so on, right? Okay. So, let us look, look at both the scenarios, all right. So, we will discuss them uh, in more detail uh, as we go to hydraulic and uh, air brakes. So, but the basic idea is the following, right? So, you have these two, <coughs> want to say brake shoes. So, these are uh, what we can label as a brake shoe and we have this uh, brake friction lining, right? So, what happens is that like uh, when the brake is applied in the brake shoes are pivoted on a backing plate as you can observe here and the force is applied here. So, this is what is called as an S-cam brake, we will come to this uh, S-cam brake later on but the cam is going to rotate here and then like it is going to push the to this end of the brake shoe away from one another. So, what will happen? These brake shoes will rotate about this pivot. They will go and contact the drum which is rotating along the wheel and if uh, decelerating torque is going to be generated. So, here in a hydraulic brake the same action, right? So, you can see this two brake shoes right and essentially there is something called as a wheel cylinder, we will discuss this later on. So, that essentially converts this uh, brake fluid pressure to a mechanical force which essentially is an actuation force and th that actuation force acts on the brake shoes and these brake shoes essentially move and then rotate about the spivot and go on contact the inner surface of the brake drum and uh, once uh, the contact is sufficient contact is made uh, uh, due to friction a uh, decelerating torque is produced, okay. So, that is the mechanism for a uh, simple uh, drum brake and we have a return spring. So, you can see this uh, return spring here, okay. So, which essentially ensures you can see a return spring even here, right. So, which essentially ensures that you know the brake shoes come back to their original position once the brake is released okay so that the contact between the lining and the drum is uh, broken so pretty uh, simple in construction and operation now uh, before we go to its analysis there are a few advantages and limitations advantages that like it's uh, we'll look at one important advantage of a drum brake as we do the analysis but we will immediately realize that as we keep on operating this drum brake what's going to happen See the brake drum is going to expand, right? With all the uh, heat energy that's resulting due to this uh, braking friction braking process. So then, what happens is that this clearance between the brake uh, friction lining and the brake drum is going to keep on increasing. Then, what happens as the clearing clearance increases, the brake shoes also have to move a longer distance to get applied, right? So, that is something we need to remember. So, uh, not only do the clearance increase due to brake pad wear, but also during the operation of the vehicle due to what is called as thermal expansion, the clearance is going to increase. So, one uh, what to say issue we must be aware of is essentially <coughs> uh, thermal expansion. Uh, 
resulting in increased clearance okay, thermal expansion of breakdown right which is resulting in the increased clearance. Okay, so, the clearance also uh, increases due to brake pad wear right, so that is another issue. Now, so another issue is that as temperature increases not only would this clearance increase due to this uh, thermal expansion even the friction properties of the brake lining would change right, the brake lining material you know is also like uh, sensitive to temperature. So, what happens is that there is something called as brake fade. So, what is brake fade? Brake fade is the reduction in the brake friction lining coefficient with increase in temperature. Okay, so, that is essentially what is called as brake fail okay so that's that's also an important issue right uh, so because we want uh, some uh, baseline brake torque right to keep the uh, to meet the design braking uh, requirements right so we don't want the coefficient of friction uh, for the, the friction lining to fall too much so that's that's an important uh, uh, aspect right so now i am what i'm going to do is that like i'm going to uh, do a very simple analysis okay of this temporary okay oops so, so let us uh, consider this drum break and then like we will uh, use simple uh, what uh, di uh, even like uh, dynamics to analyze uh, how this drum break responds and what is the output from the drum break so and if we in in fact look at the schematic you know like one shoe is what is called as a leading shoe another shoe is called is called as a trailing shoe right let us also figure out what do these mean right so I have not explained them yet we are going to uh, get a uh, what to say an understanding of these terms when we do the analysis. So, but uh, as indicated in the figure we will assume that the brake drum is rotating counterclockwise without loss of generality it can rotate the other way also but we are considering it to rotate uh, counterclockwise let us consider this leading shoe and then like let us do a uh, simple analysis okay, of this thing. So, in this analysis uh, what we are going to do is that like let us neglect the weight of the brake shoe <coughs> when compared to the other forces we are going to identify what other forces are going to come into play right. So, the mg component right of the brake shoe is something we will neglect okay we will consider it to be relatively small. We will also neglect the spring restoring force in addition to the weight of the brake shoe when compared to the other uh, force components right. So, that are acting on the brake shoe right. 